the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. On behalf of the UCSB Energy Club, I'd like to welcome to our event. Welcome you to our event. Um, my name is Sinead Kennedy, as you already know. I'm a second year College of Creative Studies biology major. Uh, we founded the Energy Club with two main major goals in sight. We wanted to put forth um, a fact base, mainly scientific information, and we wanted to create an open atmosphere for discussion. We'll be having a lot of times for question and answers at the end of this because that's the main idea that we want to present. We want to have a discussion, sort of like an open forum for people to discuss. We'd like to thank Student Affairs um, for the opportunity to make this event actually happen and to increase um, the pretty much interest and knowledge about how peak oil not only affects the environment but the economy and politics everything to what you see when you pay, or at least I paid $4 a gallon for gas yesterday. Um, we'd also like to invite you to our first meeting, our first meeting outside the four of us. Um, we're going to spread it out to hopefully get a lot of club members. It's going to be April 28th at 7 p.m. at the Student Resource Building. If you want to sign up with us, we have paper and pencil out in the front lobby, and you can leave your email, and then we'll send you a reminder. So thanks a lot for coming on behalf of the Energy Club. Welcome. Thanks. I told Sinead when we, we spoke briefly before, the, uh, before this session that it was the students who really have shown leadership in the University of California in the area of sustainability. Students have pointed the way, students have led the way, and I just want to thank Sinead and thank, thank students for taking the lead and pushing the university to where it needed to go. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Gauthier. Catherine Gauthier is Professor of Geography at UCSB. She received her doctor from the University of Paris in 1983. Dr. Gauthier has contributed broadly to climate research with, with over 200 scholarly publications, and she is deeply involved in climate education and communication to the public. She teaches innovative undergraduate courses about climate change, including living with global warming, oil and water, and mock environmental summit. In April 2008, Cambridge University Press published her book entitled Oil, Water, and Climate, An Introduction, in which she examines the powerful interconnections that link oil, water, climate, and population issues and explores ways to address these issues collectively, including the difficult political decisions and major reforms necessary in resource governance, policies, and market forces. She recently co-edited a book with Jean-Louis Fellou that was published in August 2007 in France. This book's English version, Facing Climate Change Together, underscores the need for the collaboration and cooperation of the global community. It will be published by Cambridge University Press in June 2008. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Catherine Gauthier. Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I, we thought that it might be useful for somebody to make a little, give you a little primer of what we'll be talking about tonight, and also put it in the kind of a global context. Uh, so this is what I 
we'll be doing in the next 15 minutes. So let's start with uh, yes, the, how, how the demand for oil has grown over the last few decades. Uh, you can see here that uh, over the 80s, the, you may not be able to see it directly, but the, the increase in demand has been about 1% and has then has uh, increased even faster over the 2000 period uh, by about 2%. And all this happening despite uh, the prices increases. Uh, this, this growth is not only uh, taking place in the developed countries, uh, the countries of the Organization of Economic and Cooperation and Development, but also on the de in the developing countries led by China, where uh, much of the, uh, the, the uh, there's a large augmentation or increase in uh, demand in China and projected to increase even much faster. And this is, it has overtaken not Japan and India by quite a lot. In both cases, I mean, the U.S. is uh, one of the uh, large contributor to the demand of the developed countries, and it's the transportation sector. And that's really an important issue, the transportation sector that uses two-thirds, at least in the developed countries, of the, of the oil that is used. Now, this growth is expected to continue. It is presently at about 88 million barrels per day the U.S. using 22 million barrels per day, China using 8 million barrels per day, and it's expected to continue to grow uh, by about 50% over the next uh, 30 years, 25 to, 50, to 30 years. So the question is, uh, how can the supply meet this increasing growth demand in demand? So the, to answer this question, we need to have an idea of how much oil there is. And we need to know what is the ultimate recoverable oil that exists in the world. And this is uh, what we call the estimation of reserves. So it seems like an e a simple question, you know, how much do we have? But it's not at all a simple question. And there are a lot of uncertainty associated with this estimation. One of them being that we don't always talk about the same thing. Some people talk about conventional oil, that is the, the oil that is easy to get out of the ground. Some other talk about conventional oil plus and conventional oil, which are and conventional oil being uh, the very heavy, thick oil, tar-like bitumen oil uh, that needs, requires a lot of energy and a lot of water to extract out of the ground. Also, with reserve, we're usually talking about probability of recovering certain amount. We are not sure that we'll be recovering it. So we, we talk about proven reserve, which are about 90, 95% probability of recovering it, or we talk about undiscovered reserve, which have much less probability and with various amount of probability. So if we look at what are the published estimates of the world ultimate recovery, uh, this was published in 2000 by the USGS. You can see that <coughs> it varies quite a lot. These are different investigators, different experts who have published their estimation of the same number, the ultimate uh, world oil recovery. Uh, it varies from 600 million barrels to about 4 trillion barrels. In general, what we have seen is that there have been an increase in the uh, quantity, in the amount of ultimate recovery with time, but the, af after a certain time over the, the 70s to the 90s, the, uh, the amount remained relatively constant, and there are quite a lot of variations, however, these are and these are non-negligible variations. In the U.S., we have different ways of representing, but in general, the USGS comes up with the highest uh, amount of oil recoverable. Uh, it, we look at the 95% chance of recovery, which is about 2.8 trillion barrel, the mean uh, recoverable oil, which is about 3.3 trillion barrel, and then the 5% chance, which is very little chance to recover, uh, nearly 4 trillion so, you know, when you talk, when we hear about peak oil, we are talking about all these different numbers, and depending on who is talking about, we may be talking about different things. Uh, now, uh, can the production, it's not only important to have the oil, but can we produce this oil? Can we extract it out of the ground? So, to understand, you know, uh, to make sense of it, we can turn towards history a little bit and look at what has happened with the oil recovery. Uh, what we call the lower 48 that is not including Alaska's oil. And you, in, in the late 60s, uh, King Hubert, Dr. King Hubert, uh, realized that uh, the oil 
uh, was peaking, each field was peaking at a certain amount, and when you put the entire recoverable oil for a country, you had a peak, sorry, uh, for <coughs> The, 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 the production. So he also noticed that there was about a 40-year period separating the maximum discovery, which is in green here, and the maximum oil production. So based on that, he came up uh, with a certain model, which uh, we we're going to be look we're looking at in, in a minute. Another way of looking at it is to think that uh, in order to, have to produce oil, we need to uh, discover it, and then once uh, uh, the difference between the discovery and the production uh, becomes negative, it means that we will be aiming towards a peak very soon. And if you put all the data together, the best data available, we find that uh, around <coughs> it's around 1980 that these, we reached that period where the, uh, the discovery, the production went faster than the discovery, which meant we were not recovering as much oil as we were producing. We were even from the old, old oil field that were starting to deplete it. And even by drilling more, we were not able to help the amount of oil that we were discovering. Therefore, we are, as starting in 80, we were going towards a peak. So there is no, no point that, I mean, no discussion that there, was, there will be a peak in the conventional oil, so it cannot be avoided, but the question is, when will it be? And this is probably where the, the issue is, uh, the most difficult, where we face the most difficulties. So what is, when will the peak of oil happen, peak oil timing? So first, let's be clear about what the definition of peak oil is. Uh, the peak oil is when the maximum production rate is reached. Most of the time, this is when we have used about half of the endowment of oil that is available. And to, in order to know that, to know where this peak will be, uh, it, we need to have a knowledge of what are the reserves, and we talked a little bit about what the difficulties were with the reserve. We need to know how much we have extracted so far, which is the sum of the two is total amount, and we need to know how fast we're going to be extracting in the future, the rate of extraction in the future, which is a difficult thing to estimate. But let's look at the reserve first. We saw some numbers uh, varying with different investigators, but there are other issues. For instance, it is not clear how much oil Saudi Arabia has. Uh, Simmons has suggested that the number that are being uh, reported are not accurate and that is, is asking, I mean, a number of people are asking for more transparencies in the reporting of oil so we have an idea of how much there is, uh, of oil there is. Uh, there is a bit report that there is oil in the Arctic. Some people suggest that a quarter of the remaining reserves are in the Arctic. Uh, there is also some <coughs> recent discovery of oil along the coast of Brazil. So, and finally, there are some revised estimation of unconventional, conventional undiscovered oil. In uh, 2003, the USGS, for instance, published a revision of the undiscovered amount of oil. Again, to estimate this uh, undiscovered oil, we have to figure out you know, how much there is in the ground, and we have only limited data, so it's somewhat of an art to make this estimation. But, and third is, uh, figure out what is the future consumption. And that, then again, there is an art in trying to figure it out because it depends on what kind of life, lifestyle will various countries have, how fast the, the, the population will grow, what kind of energy they will use, whether they are heavy, uh, largely dependent on oil, their lifestyle, their energy usage depends on oil or not. So these are all uncertainty that are taking, that are making difficult the estimation of peak oil. But there are some ways, fortunately, of doing it relatively uh, with simple model. And now I'm going to look at a couple of models to probably refresh your memory if you, have, you probably have seen that before. So the first one is the simplest one. It's, called, it's based on Hubert's uh, analysis of the U.S. Uh, data. And it's, called, it's based on the logistic curve. It's a mathematical curve that was uh, developed initially for population uh, estimation. And uh, in here, we are looking at the cumulative production. Basically, what this shows us is that as a function of time, we will be uh, producing and we are going to add all our production. So uh, if we look at the cumul cumulative production, it will increase with time and eventually will reach the maximum av amount of oil available. So you may or may not have seen this curve, but if you look at the derivative, if you 
done a little bit of mathematics, at some point, the derivative is the one that you normally look at, which is the production curve as a function of time, which from this shows us that there is a maximum at half time here. So there is maximum of production. And the important thing is that this curve is symmetrical. And this curve is only valid, this model is only valid when we look at large population of fields, because this is what gives the symmetry of the curve. And uh, also, it's, this kind of model is valid if we, have, we are following natural patterns of discovery and production. And if this production, for instance, is not impeded by variations in economic uh, factors or political events like in the 1980s where we had some reduction of production, for instance. And then finally, another way of presenting the same curve is to plot the production over cumulative uh, production versus uh, production. And I'm showing this one because it's all the same because we will be discussing very much uh, this curve tonight in, in the presentation. Okay, now, the history, if we look at historical data and compare to our model, uh, this uh, logistic model, we see that uh, there is quite a, quite a good uh, coherence between our, the, the data point here. It's a little bit uh, complex in terms of what the data are showing here and shown here, and Jeffrey will explain to you what, what they are. But in general, we can approximate relatively well the evolution of the production as a function of time, and similarly when we plot it in this form. So the history is uh, telling us that this approach is relatively uh, good. Now, this is not the way everybody does the estimation of, of peak oil, because uh, the USGS does it quite differently. In fact, they are, they are uh, looking at um, production of history, and instead of uh, assuming that eventually it will come down relatively symmetrically uh, around the a peak period, they assume that the production is going to increase because the demand is going to increase, it's increasing at 2%, uh, that the production will increase to follow the demand up to a point uh, which they, s they specify to be a, a reserve of a production of a value of 10. And depending on the amount of ultimate recovery and the ultimate uh, decline rate, they find slightly different time for peaking. But the important thing here is you see that this, the curve, so for instance, for uh, a low probability of, reco of ultimate recovery of 2.2 trillion, they find a, 20, a 2026 peak. Uh, compared to, we'll see, a, a 2010 peak or 27 to 2010 peak for other methods. Uh, and it's not symmetrical, and basically we are producing as much as we can, and then it falls abruptly after the peak. It's quite different. And the question is whether we're capable of, the, whether we want, and whether we are capable of producing that much oil. It's a, an important question. So uh, if we look at, so what is, where is the peak? You can ask me, I mean, everybody is asking where, where is the peak? Uh, if you follow the Hubert curve, the peak is around this period of time, 27, 2010. And these are various, again, various estimations of peak. And you can see there are, there's a large variety of peak and there are some people like GSGS suggesting it's a 2030, 2040, but we have even numbers that are going beyond that. So. Uh, now, there's other way of looking at the problem. Another way is to say, okay, now we are going to have a demand, and instead of looking at the peak in, in the production, we'll, we're going to see how can we meet, can we satisfy this demand. And this is what the uh, uh, <clears throat> energy in, International Energy Agency is, is doing. And... Um, for its estimate. So here they are making some assumption. They use various scenarios of demand, and here we p I picked one, which is a 2% initial and then uh, a re reduction after 2030. And they look at various scenarios of how can we meet the, this demand. And in this case, they are suggesting that we will meet the demand uh, up to, uh, uh, to pretty much now with conventional oil, but that in order to meet the growing demand that is occurring right now, we'll need to bring in unconventional oil like tar sand from Alaska, from um, Canada, or oil shale from, from um, Venezuela. And then that this contribution of these unconventional oil will become larger and larger, that, and, but that eventually uh, the, there will be a peak in all these resources and then we'll get to a decrease. But 
if we use all this, the, the unconventional oil that we have, we'll be able to meet some of the demand up to a certain point. Now, uh, let me turn this on. One minute, okay. Now, to end up, uh, this is a, a, a graph that shows another version uh, of the peak oil curve, the production versus time. And this is done by the uh, Cambridge Energy Research Associate, CIRA. And it's basically is telling us a similar story, except that they even have a scenario that is more catastrophic in a sense of energy use, usage, which they call the Asian Phoenix, which means where all the Asian countries are really uh, do it, going through an economic boom and, and using as much energy, as much oil as they can and that, as is available. In this case, what we see is that we have to bring in even more rapidly in conventional oil, assuming that we're capable of producing this oil, but the problem with this is that uh, all this unconventional oil, I think for me as, a, as an environmentally concerned person, is that they have extremely damaging environmental impact. Both the mine, which are uh, outdoor mines, are uh, ap impacting the environment. They you require water to extract the, uh, the, the tar sand and produce oil out of them. And in addition, they are very heavy they have a heavy content in carbon, and they have very high greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, this is very concerning that, that we are considering uh, meeting the demand instead of starting to think about reducing the demand, but meeting the demand with this unconventional oil. Uh, and this is even in a case where uh, they expect that the peak of conventional oil will be the, around 2030. So with very large uh, increase of demand in from Asia, will be, will have to come up with, will have to use this unconventional oil. And I think it's really important that people be aware of that possibility. So basically, uh, I would like to just to finish talking about the, the consequence of, of peak oil and whether we, are, we have reached the peak or not. What we expect is as a consequence of peak oil is that there will be a potential economic chaos uh, because the price of oil will increase. So now you can link what I'm saying here to what is happening now, maybe what will happen in the future, it's really up to you to assess that. Uh, we expect that it will be a destabilization of the global economy and a number of consequences, direct and indirect consequences as a, uh, as a result of peak oil. So basically uh, the point I would like to leave you with is that uh, there are, we have to make choices with regard to energy security. We need to have s a certain amount of energy and. A, we need oil. We still need oil. We can change our st lifestyle, but it's going to take some time. And there are countries like China, India, Brazil, Russia in particular, who are coming along with a very high demand for oil for their transportation in large part. And that for uh, that we will need to have a portfolio of, of energy production, one for, for the liquid uh, energy for in the form of oil and one for other types of energy to create electricity or to create heating, which we already do, but we have to be careful of what choices we make of this energy portfolio so that they are uh, not impacting our environment. So the choices have to be made and with some climatic consciousness. Okay, I, will, I will stop here. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Godier for a really an extraordinarily concise and clear primer on peak oil. Thank you very much. I even understood it, which was a... It's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Jeffrey Brown. Jeffrey J. Brown graduated from Texas A&M University with a B.S. in geophysics. He is a member of the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, and he is a licensed professional geoscientist in the state of Texas. Since the early 1980s, Jeffrey has worked as an exploration geoscientist, primarily in Texas, but with some exploration work in Australia and other basins in the United States, and he has located several commercial oil and gas fields. He is currently managing an aggressive exploration program looking for leftover oil and gas fields in west central Texas. Inspired by Matt Simmons' work, early work, and the work by Kenneth DeFees, Jeffrey Brown has been studying the peak oil issue for several years, 
with particular emphasis on peak exports versus peak production. This evening, he presents his views on the serious implications of declining oil production combined with accelerating worldwide demand. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Jeffrey Brown. I uh, first want to uh, say how honored I am to uh, you know, share the uh, uh, podium with Dr. Gautier and uh, how honored I am that, that I was invited uh, by the University of California and appreciate all the hard work that the uh, faculty and you know, staff have uh, put into this event. And I'd like to acknowledge the early work uh, you know, that we built our work on uh, by uh, Matt Simmons, Kenneth uh, DeFees, and then indirectly uh, Dr. Hubbard's uh, pioneering work on uh, peak oil. And especially I'd like to point out that my co-author Samuel Fouché has done the bulk of the work on this project. He's uh, done approximately 90 percent of it. And a lot of it's based on uh, a lot, you know, good deal of quantitative modeling and uh, calculus. And fortunately I made a, an agreement with my uh, math professor at A&M two or three decades ago. He agreed to give me a passing grade in, my, in partial differential equations and boundary value problems if I agreed never to really use calculus in any endeavor. So I'm, uh, I'm sticking by that agreement. And fortunately, my co-author is a, a mathematical genius. Uh, we're going to do it, uh, this in three parts. First, I'll do a kind of an update on peak oil and review of some of the, the uh, predictions and the, go over the modeling again. Second part is a, the, the, the bulk of the talk. It's on net oil export capacity. And then part three, I'm going to talk about uh, electrification and transportation primarily and some ways to uh, cope with uh, a constrained uh, energy future. This is a uh, chart showing uh, fossil fuels as a continuum from uh, methane to natural gas liquids, to uh, condensate, to light sweet crude, to heavy sour crude, to bitumen, which is in the tar sands deposits, uh, to coal. And it's also a progression from gas to, to liquid to solid. And as you go from left to right, it's also a progression from cleanest to dirtiest. Uh, methane is you know, one carbon atom, four hydrogen atoms, and off, over on the right side, uh, coal, you know, anthracite coal is almost exclu exclusively carbon. So the, the, the uh, carbon content and contaminants increase. Of course, you get all the, you know, the mercury and everything else in the coal deposits on the right-hand side. And what this represents is qualitatively, the, uh, the curve is the energy and capital input necessary to drive liquid transportation fuels. So we get the most buying for the buck, so to speak, from light, sweet crude. We get the maximum amount of diesel, jet fuel, gasoline for the least expenditure of money and energy. And that's what we're you know, arguably you know, uh, most short of right now is light, sweet crude. Now, in tonight's talk, I'm going to uh, focus initially on condensate, light, sweet crude, and heavy sour crude. It's what we call crude plus condensate. And then when I get to the export talk, we'll broaden that somewhat to total liquids. This is a, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is the uh, classic lower 48 produ uh, time production rate versus time graph. It's 21 years centered on 1970. And in 1956, Dr. Hubbard made two if-then statements. He said, if ultimate recoverable is 150 billion barrels, we peak in 1966. If ultimate recoverable is 200 billion barrels, we peak in 1971. And the key point there is a one-third increase in estimated ultimate recoverable reserves from 150 to 200 delayed the peak by all of five years. That's a key point to keep in mind when you hear about, you know, well, you know, an offshore discovery here is going to save us. You know, the, you know, some shale play in an extremely tight fractured rock is going to save us. You know, one-third increase delayed the peak by five years. It goes back to the old story about the, you know, exponential growth versus a finite resource base. You know, it's the, and the odd thing is that, you know, the conventional wisdom is that, you know, we can have an infinite rate of increase against a finite resource base. You know, the, the crackpots are the ones that believe we live in a finite world. 
Dr. Uh, Herbert in early 80s outlined the uh, logistic method, which has been nicknamed Herbert linearization or HL now widely in peak oil circles. And as Dr. Gautier pointed out, it's we uh, take the th two numbers we have the most confidence in, annual production and cumulative to date, and we take the ratio of annual production divided by cumulative on the vertical axis versus cumulative on the horizontal axis. And what this is, is a way to estimate the area under a parabolic curve. And with time, this data shows this you know, steady uh, uh, linear progression. You got a very noisy phase, and then you're under a li uh, steady linear progression. Well, if you look at the green points, we did a little exercise. The, we took the, uh, you know, from the point it entered a linear progression to 1970 when the lower 48 peaked, and then we generated a predicted production curve. So the, this red curve was generated using only data up to 1970. And the post-1970 cumulative lower 48 oil production was 99% of what the model predicted it would be, using again using only data through 1970 to construct the model. Now my, uh, I'm sorry, this goes too fast. Now this is uh, Kenneth DeFees in his second book uh, outlined the logistic method and estimated that world uh, oil production would peak uh, between 2004 and 2008, uh, most likely in 2005. Uh, he was using a crude plus condensate, the, which is a more conservative measure of oil production, and he gave the ultimate recoverable for the world 2,000 billion barrels, and we'd produced uh, about a thousand billion barrels through the 2004-2000 time frame. Now, if you take annual production in around 2004-2005, uh, it's around 73-74 million barrels a day. You multiply that times 365, it's around 25 billion barrels per year. Okay, four times 25 is a hundred billion barrels. Now, let's put that in perspective. George Bush's first four-year presidential term we used 10% of all oil that has ever been consumed. And on Dr. DeFee's model, in the second four years of George Bush's term, ending in, thank God, in January 2009, <laughs> uh, we're going to consume 10% of all remaining conventional reserves based on his model. And to remind you, our lower 48 case history was 99% accurate in predicting post-peak cumulative production. One other point, the, uh, this is, uh, these are different vertical scales. The black is lower 48, the uh, blue is world, and it shows the production data through 2007. The initial lower 48 decline was about 0.8% per year, and the initial world decline we've seen so far relative to 2005 is 0.3% per year. So we've seen a slight annual uh, decline in world crude oil production in 2006 and 7. And the lower 48 uh, you know, de uh, decline rate's been about 2% per year. And it's a, fed, a fairly gradual decline rate. And almost everyone has been just focusing on the total, total production curve. Of course, what we think is important is the uh, export situation I'll get to in a moment. And my uh, co-author and I uh, thought it would be an interesting experiment to apply the this Hubbard linearization or logistic method to the two swing producers, Texas and uh, the successor Saudi Arabia. A swing producer is a, a, a producing region that regulates its production to keep oil prices within a defined range. And through an odd twist of naming, the Texas Railroad Commission, which has almost nothing to do with railroads, uh, regulated Texas oil production. And for a period about 1935 to 1970, three commissioners in the Texas Railroad Commission effectively controlled the world price of oil by raising and lowering Texas oil production within defined limits. So the Texas, this is a Texas logistic plot. It's fairly noisy uh, at the, uh, 
right in the pre-peak area. But if you look at the totality of the data set, you know, we enter this strong linear progression pointing downward to, you know, between 60 and 70 billion ultimate recoverable. So what we can say is we look at the totality of the data set and we can figure out when Texas peaked. And it's about, you know, 57% of ultimate recoverable reserves. So what about Saudi Arabia? Well, this is the Saudi logistic plot through 2005. We're showing a you know strong linear trend. There's a little bit of a you know, little dog leg up in the uh, last three years, of going up to 2005 as Saudi Arabia is ramping up production. But overall, it's it's showing a much stronger uh, linear trend than what we saw in Texas. Now, through 2005, Saudi Arabia was 58% depleted. And Texas, in 72, peaked at 57% depleted. And Saudi Arabia is the successor swing producer. So we generated this plot. The uh, black uh, data points are Texas, 1972 to 19, uh, 1962 to 1982, centered on 1972. And we've got Saudi production through 2005 in blue, and again, these are different vertical scales. Uh, Saudi Arabia had a higher production rate than Texas. So we've got two additional data points, 2006 and 2007. And this is what the data look like. So it's, you know, what I would classify this as, as strongly suggestive of a final Saudi peak, but not yet conclusive. But, but we can observe three key things. You know, or uh, you know, besides obvious, you know, the stages of depletion. Uh, Texas, from 1972 to 1980, uh, we had a thousand percent increase in oil prices, and we had the biggest drilling boom in state history. And what happened was the production went from three and a half million barrels a day in '72 to two and a half in '82. So post peak. What Texas showed was higher crude oil prices, up by 1,000%, increased drilling yielded lower production. And what we're presently seeing in Saudi Arabia is a significant increase in oil prices, which are, uh, in the past year, oil prices are going up at a rate that would double every 18 months. And they've seen a significant increase in drilling starting in late 2004. So what, the Saudi, what Saudi Arabia is presently showing is higher crude oil prices plus increased drilling equals lower production. Now this is my attempt to uh, rebut the uh, Saudi Aramco, Exxon Mobil argument. Uh, Saudi Aramco and Exxon Mobil both say that higher technology will save us. So we've got all this great new tools and we can do a much better job of recovering oil and uh, ExxonMobil has a little variation to that. They say that we've got great technology, but you know, if we had unlimited access to the fields in the Middle East and elsewhere, we could do a better job than Saudi Aramco. So I you know, developed a, a, you know, two little ways to test that. You know, we've got our Texas model here again. Uh, this time Texas is in, in blue, and North Sea is in black. Okay. North Sea peaked in 1999, uh, Texas peaked in 72, and I just lined the two peaks up with each other. Now, these two regions have three very interesting characteristics, developed by private oil companies, using the best available technology, with virtually no restrictions on drilling. Texas has shown a long-term decline rate of 4% per year. North Sea has shown a long-term decline rate of 4.5% per year. So my question is, if major oil companies can't reverse the conventional oil declines in Texas and North Sea, why would they be able to reverse the conventional declines anywhere in the world? This is a, the crux of our argument. Um, let's, uh, um, uh, let's you know, stipulate what I call export land. In export land, the initial conditions are we're producing two million barrels a day and we're consuming one. And we hit peak production and production begins declining at about 5% per year, much like Texas and the North Sea. 
and consumption begins increasing at about 2.5% per year. What this results in is net oil exports going to zero in nine years, even when export land is still you know, uh, producing about 1.3 million barrels a day or so. And if we assign some production numbers to this, uh, only 10% of post-peak production would be exported. 90% of post-peak production would be consumed domestically. And furthermore, let's assume no increase in uh, consumption. Assume it flatlines at 1 million barrels a day, zero increase in consumption. Net exports would go to zero in 14 years. So you assume some level of increase, they go to zero in nine, uh, assume zero increase, they go to zero in 14. So this is a you know, little mathematical model. And about the top line here is, is declining production. This is increasing consumption. And this is declining net oil exports. So look at, let's look at some case histories. This is a fairly complex graph I'll, I'll, I'll go over. Uh, the vertical scale is year-over-year -year rate of change, and these are 10 percentage point increments. And what we did was lined up the year-over-year -year change from final peak for our export land model, ELM, for Indonesia, and for the UK. And first, let's assume a, you know, a flat 10 percent decline rate. You know, it would be a horizontal line. You know, a, a flat exponential decline rate would be you know, par uh, parallel to the horizontal axis. So if it's 10%, 10%, 10%, it'd be flat line going out. What these curves show is an accelerating decline rate. So we're going from, for ELM, around 12%, 13 to 15, 16, 17, 20%, 25%, 32%, 45%. So these are year-over-year -year changes in net oil exports. So it's an accelerating decline rate. And look at UK and Indonesia. And by the way, these two countries were consuming about half of their production at peak. Uh, the uh, Indonesia went to zero in eight years. They had a production decline rate of about 3.9%, consumption rate of increase 4.1% overall net export decline rate over the time period of 29% per year. Uh, UK was about 7.8% de production decline rate, consumption increased just barely 0.2%, uh, net export decline rate 55.7% per year over the, over the period. The point is, the, see the similarity in these curves, you know, the, this accelerating decline rate with time. Oh, and one other point, uh, Indonesia was characterized by low per capita income, UK high per capita income. UK taxed energy consumption, Indonesia subsidized energy consumption. And the net difference between the two was UK went to zero in seven years, Indonesia went to zero in eight years. So I would think that virtually every net oil export in the world would fall somewhere in a continuum in terms of per capita income and rate of change of consumption between UK and Indonesia. And you know, back to conventional wisdom for a moment, this is one of my favorite quotes from The Economist magazine in 2006. They asserted that Saudi Arabia could produce at its then current rate for 70 years without ever finding another drop of oil. And the implication being that they could be a reliable supplier of oil to the world for seven decades. I found the C word missing from this. What about consumption? Well, we, the, the black flat line is the flat line 11 million barrel a day production rate. The blue line is we simply took the 2005-2006 uh, rate of increase in consumption, about 5.7 percent per year, and extrapolated it. So with a flat line production, zero decline, Saudi Arabia would quit exporting oil in 2036. And by the way, if you extrapolate that out for seven decades, Saudi Arabia would be consuming 108 million barrels a day in 2075 versus you know, total world production right now, total liquids around you know, 86, 88 million barrel a day range. 
Well, this is the start of our you know, five case histories. We're looking at Saudi Arabia, Russia, Norway, Iran, United Arab Emirates. They account for half of world net oil exports. Uh, total world oil exports around, you know, in 2005, around 46, 47 million barrels a day. The top five exported 23.5 million barrels a day total liquids in 2005. And what we did is used our logistic method to predict future production and we did middle case and then a low case, high case, 95% confidence interval. We think there's 95% probability the production would fall between uh, these outer boundaries, this being the most likely case. And then we used a Monte Carlo method to estimate future production uh, based on uh, recent uh, history, and again, basically did low case, middle case, high case. So this gave us a range of points at which uh, production would equal consumption. And then we subtracted out net oil exports. So our middle case for Saudi Arabia, world's largest net oil exporter, is that they hit or approach zero. I'll, I'll, I'll define the difference between hit and approach in a little while. Uh, they approach zero net oil exports around 2031. Uh, you know, within a confidence interval, and our estimated initial 10-year decline rate is about 4.7 percent per year, you know, plus or minus. And Saudi Arabia is currently showing uh, in 2006 and 2007 back-to-back -back ex an, an accelerating decline rate in net oil exports. Russia is very interesting. We uh, just had a little bit of news about Russia today. Uh, this is a very complex case history. The, uh, this sudden plunge in production uh, was a result of the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. And we uh, actually did a little model of that. We took uh, the, we used a logistic method, same thing we did for lower 48. We cut the model off in 1984 and predicted post-1984 cumulative production. Uh, production. Well, the post-1984 cumulative production through 2004 was 95% what the model predicted it would be. And we think this rebound in production right here was simply making up for what was not produced following the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in, through, uh, in 2006 7 Russia has now made up for the deficiency. In the past three months, they've, they've shown three straight months of declining production. And Vice President of Luke Oil, uh, one of the large Russian oil companies, uh, said today, that Russia had their final peak in 2005, and he compared them uh, to the declines in the North Sea and Mexico, which are both showing rapid decline rates. Now, the consumption is quite conservative. We were kind of stuck with our model, and, and it was biased toward recent uh, production rates, but this is a pr almost certainly extremely conservative. Russia's on track to become the number one car market in Europe within two years, and, and consumption in almost all oil exporting countries is going, going up like crazy, because we're seeing this positive feedback loop. Even where these countries are showing declining production, their cash flow from export sales is increasing because of rising oil prices. So what they're seeing in, in currency terms is rising cash flow even as our export volumes decline. Okay, so this is our uh, outlook for Russian oil exports, initial 10-year decline rate of 8% per year, and we show them approaching zero net oil exports around 2024, 20, 25. This is the world's second largest net oil exporter. Uh, Norway is pretty cut and dried, uh, and you see how close the uh, you know, projected lines are. They're on the downslope of the curve, falling at a fairly rapid clip. We show Norway, the world's third largest net oil exporter, uh, also approaching zero sometime in the 2024 time frame. Iran is a little more complex and it's got a little wider uh, confidence uh, intervals, but we show them approaching zero, our middle case around 2029, initial decline rate about 4.9% per year, plus or minus. And this is United Arab Emirates, the fifth largest net oil exporter. Uh, it's got some of the widest confident inter intervals on both production and consumption. And our metal case shows them approaching zero around 2037 with some you know, fairly broad confidence intervals. Well, we, then we took all five of those and summed them into the top five. So this is the sum of our outlook. 
we, their, our middle case shows the top five net oil exporters, half of current world, world oil exports approaching zero around 2031. And they have shown, sorry, they've shown two years of back-to-back -back declines. The initial decline was about 800,000 barrels per day in 06. Estimate they were down a million barrels a day in 2007. And if we do a little bit of simple math, um, these declines tend to approximate linear declines, like a, or fixed. So an exponential decline is you know five percent, five percent, five percent. It's five percent of a smaller number every year. A linear decline would be like you start from a million and drop it to hundred thousand per day per year. So it's a fixed volume, which is an accelerating decline rate. Well, if you take the initial 800,000 and estimated million for 07, it's, and average it, it's 900,000 barrels uh, per day, per year average decline, it's 0.9 million. If you divide 23.5 by 0.9, it suggests 26 years of remaining net oil exports. 26 plus 2005 gives you uh, 2031. So, what is, convention, what is our conventional wisdom outlook for oil exports you know, versus reality? This is a graph of U.S. oil imports. Uh, you know, from around 5 million barrels in the early 80s, we're up to around 12, 13 million barrels per day now. Our imports have been growing as our overall consumption has grown and as our domestic production has fallen. And we're right now uh, right about here, right around 12 million barrels a day. And then these blue lines are the projected uh, net oil exports for the top five. So in round numbers, in 05, we were importing about half of the net oil exports by the top five. Well, let's slide this over a little bit. You know, our middle case in about 10 years, 2017, 2018 range, our middle case is it would take all of the combined net oil exports from Saudi Arabia, Russia, Norway, Iran, United Arab Emirates to meet current U.S. import demand. So what is the net result of all this? I think what's happening is that we're seeing progressive demand destruction. I think we're seeing importers bidding against each other for declining oil exports. And there are some interesting uh, aspects to this. You know, let's look at all oil consumers in all oil importing countries in the world, and let's mentally break them into five groups, five quintiles of equal population size, but ranked by income. So you got the lowest quintile to the highest quintile. And let's say at the, you know, at the very bottom of the bottom, we've got a, you know, a, a poor third world consumer. And then at the very top of the top, we've got Bill Gates. So what energy price is necessary to force Bill Gates to conserve energy? Now, what energy price is necessary to force our third world consumer to conserve energy? But also, as we move up that, the food chain along those quintiles, the cumulative purchasing power for each quintile, even the population sizes are the same, but the cumulative purchasing power increases by huge orders of magnitude, just vast increases. And imagine, another way of saying it, the percentage of your income spent on energy declines as we go up these quintiles. So, Given a declining oil export situation, what that requires is an accelerating rate of increase in prices in order to equalize supply and demand as we go up the food, as forced energy conservation goes up the food chain. So I think that's what's happening right now. What this is leading to is not an exponential increase in oil prices. What it's leading to is a geometric progression. What we're going to see is 50, 100, 200, 400 dollars a barrel. And the only question is going to be the period between the doublings. We're currently on track to double oil prices every 18 months. And so we're, you know, as we go up this, the food chain, as we, as it's an auction of declining oil exports you know, higher up the income ladder. And we're seeing a similar situation in food. Uh, we're, you know, food exporters like uh, rice exporters, especially Egypt, Vietnam, are, are curtailing rice exports. 
and it's the same kind of dynamics. Basically, the exporters take care of the home team first. And we saw an interesting kind of daisy chain in the winter. A, uh, one of the former Russian republics cut off gas exports to Iran, which I thought was odd in and of itself. <laughs> Iran had to import gas. But uh, they, Iran cut off gas exports to Turkey, uh, a far wealthier country. Turkey cut off gas exports to Greece. So you had a supply shortfall. So it was not a question of, you know, the gas goes to the high bidder, and it was not a question of join hands and kumbaya and we'll share a scarce resource. It was kind of what I call the middle finger salute to the export market. You know, it's we're taking care of the home team, and, you know, too bad. And it, what's fascinating about it is the price didn't really enter into the issue. And that's, you know, but I think that's what's causing this you know, acceleration in the markets because what's left over after home demand is taken care of is what we're bidding for. So you've got this accelerating decline in exports combined with a requirement for an accelerating price increase. And so we're going to see this geometric progression. And you know, the short answer to what we're headed for is I think in large parts of suburbia are a toast. So as, as Jim Kunstler said, American suburbia is the biggest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. It is the biggest financial disaster in world history, never to be repeated. It's a system that has no future and that is built on the expectation of an infinite rate of increase against a finite resource base. Uh, which part? Jim Kunstler. Uh, I think we're headed to sort of, you know, to sort of triage operation. Uh, we're, you know, we're trying to salvage what we can, and, uh, and a, you know, one third is gone, or one part's gone, try to salvage what we can, and, you know, one part, like, you know, downtown Portland's going to do great. I'll finish up with what I call my peak oil tranquilizer, having given you all the bad news. This is a picture of uh, San Angelo, Texas, circa 1908. If, if you look at the picture, they got a kid riding a bicycle horse drawn carriage, of which you know, my, horses, my daughter think horses would be a great way to get around. Uh, people walking along the street, electric transportation. Population, 18,000 people, 1908. I haven't researched it. I'm fairly certain they didn't build this with a federal grant. And it was built with essentially zero oil input. Now, Alan, a friend of mine, Alan Drake, has intensively studied this issue. He pointed out in 1890 and 1910, we built out an electric transportation system in the U.S. with minimal oil input. Uh, and in a great case history in Switzerland in the Second World War, they were cut off from oil and responded by accelerating the rate of increase in the, the, their uh, electrification transportation program. Today, the average American uses as much oil as 400 Swiss used in 1945. And I think we're crippled by our dependency on the car. You know, the, I read a quote that the American love affair with a car is a lot like Stockholm Syndrome. It's where the hostages identify with the captor. So, you know, we're identifying with that which is killing us. And we're crippled by our lack of imagination and by our, our lack of realization that there are alternatives. And there are alternatives a way to get around. And so my final point I would make tonight, if San Angelo, Texas, a hundred years ago could build this with no federal money, with no, practically no oil input, what's keeping Santa Barbara from building an electric uh, trolley car system going down, connecting uh, you know, the, well, from one end of the town to the other end of the town, you know, using wind uh, power and photovoltaics? Thank you very much.